Welcome to our panel, ISO 20022 Implementation for High Value Payment Systems. My name is Mike Hoganson. I'm the Director of Links at Payments Canada, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. This is really an exciting time in the payments industry. Building on the successful implementation of uh, Links last summer, the Canadian community, along with uh, the global community, are busy with testing and implementation activities in preparation for uh, ISO 20022 launch coming this November. This has been many years uh, in the making and it's amazing to think that we are just over uh, 200 days away from implementation. I'm thrilled today to have our panel of experts with us to speak to you uh, from their perspectives on how are we approaching this implementation how are the risks uh, being managed from the various participants? And what are the benefits to the community as we look forward to this ISO 20022 implementation for high value payment systems? So I'd like to welcome and thank our speakers for participating uh, at this year's Payments Canada Summit. Before we start our discussion, uh, I'd like to open the floor to our speakers for some brief introductions. Kellyanne, let's start with you, please. Thanks, Mike. So I'm super honored to be able to speak at the summit again this year. And for me, it will be two years here at SWIFT in June. And I currently run a global payment experts team and, and payment market infrastructure experts team in a newly formed go-to-market uh, or part of our organization in business development. So our team is really in charge of executing the SWIFT strategy, and that's through the adoption of our strategic services. We provide product and market expertise across GPI and the full value added service portfolio. And we also engage the industry to enable frictionless in, uh, instant payments. And really the last two years has been focused on our cross-border payments ISO 20022 migration, and it's been one of our primary objectives. In fact, if you've attended one of our webinars over the last couple of years, uh, anywhere around the world in a multiple set of languages, you probably heard someone from my payments team talk you through the migration, talk you through the, the timeline, specifically what you needed to do, and pointed you to some great resources uh, for you to help with the migration. I also want to mention that we have a separate payment market infrastructures team now, and it's really uh, a nod to PMIs are very core to our strategy. We support 119 Team, payment market infrastructures globally across 130 countries. And really the creation of the team was a nod to what's gonna happen after we get 10,000 participants on ISO 22 start that journey this November. And we turn and look at the rest of our PMIs and help them on that journey uh, through 2025. So super excited to be here to talk about the cross-border payments migration, as well as how we're supporting our payment market infrastructures. Great, thank you. Uh, over to you, Rob. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be here as well. Um, so my name is Rob McGee. I'm the program director for the Australian ISO 2022 Industry Migration Program. Um, the program is being run by the Australian Payments Network, or, or AusPayNet, as we're known. Um, AusPayNet is the payments industry self-regulator in Australia, and, and we have been around for about 30 years. Um, running clearing frameworks for checks and cards, um, high value and, and other forms of digital payments. Um, I myself have been at AusPayNet for nearly 18 years, um, running all sorts of payments industry projects and teams um, related to all of those frameworks through, throughout that time. Um, AusPayNet's a member owned and funded organization. We have 150 members, uh, 45 of which are participants in our high value system. Um, and, and I guess relevant to the ISO 20022 conversation, I'll, I'll mention that AusPayNet also created um, the new payments platform, which is now a, an independent organization in Australia, but that's our domestic real time retail system, which um, also runs on the ISO 20022 standard. And, and that was launched in 2017. Um, so AusPayNet was appointed to, to run this ISO 2022 migration program by the Reserve Bank of Australia and, and by our participants. Great, thanks Rob. Uh, and last but not least, Lisa. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, and like my colleagues here, just thrilled to be back to the summit. I can remember when we first pivoted the summit as a community and PayCan led the way on 
bringing thought leadership to the agenda and uh, bringing some, some great discussion on how we can reflect on what's happening in our own community, but also, as we can see, learn from our colleagues globally as well. So just a great call out to that, and I'm thrilled to be here. So Lisa Lansdowne Higgins, um, I work with Royal Bank of Canada, and as part of my role there at Royal Bank, I'm part of the, what we call the business financial services team. And in there, we really support the broad spectrum of customers from what we would call your traditional small business, right up to some of our uh, large corporate uh, that have a significant global presence. And as part of my role there, um, I head up the team that does business transformation and oversees business deposits. Now what sits underneath there uh, from, from my perspective is how we've been thinking through new models, new business models, new solution sets that we want to bring to our business customers in the business community across the board. And so we've really pivoted on how we're working differently, how we've really embraced this notion of business agility, but then to work with our partners at the industry level on transformation like ISO, like real-time rails, like the, the links migration and the work that uh, we've been mobilizing around that as a community. In addition to my portfolio, though, would sit business deposits, but underneath that are cash management. So you're more traditional client facing cash management type solutions that includes payments. So many of the individuals across the teams are fully engaged in uh, what we're looking at with the full migration of ISO globally. Um, I've been in payments for a long time. I, I'm, I don't really like to say how many years any longer, uh, but uh, what I've loved about it is it's a space that's constantly transforming, constantly bringing opportunity to the market um, and working with our market infrastructures and then working as well with our partners globally to, to understand what are the needs of our customers and what do we need to do to be able to service those needs, whether that's international or domestic. Uh, so just thrilled to be here today and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Great. Thanks very much, everyone. Well, let's get started. Um, Rob, I will uh, kick things off with you. Just wondering if you can tell us a bit in, around uh, Australia's approach uh, for what you've been doing in the high value payment space uh, with ISO 20022, uh, working towards implementation um, and what were, from your perspective, you know, what were some of the drivers in terms of determining that approach uh, with the ecosystem? Um, thanks, thanks, Mike. Yeah, it it, um, <clears throat> it it feels like we've been at this for quite a long time already, to be honest. Um, and and I think our, our approach fundamentally was driven by consultation with Australian industry participants, and so back in two thousand and nineteen. The Reserve Bank of Australia started um, a, a consultation process that ran through a, a number of iterations of industry consultation and, and um, refinement based on what we learned from, from talking to participants. And that, and that process ran for longer than a year. Um, we really tried to draw out what their preferences were around um, approach and scope and, and timing. And we thought about things like big bang versus coexistence. And so, you know, what, what factors came into play there, we, you know, looking at the pros and cons, timing. I, I think mostly our, our thinking there was just around the CBPR plus timeline and whether we wanted to go at the same time or before or later. Um, and, and also some important scope questions. We, we grappled with this like for like concept, which I know a lot of market infrastructures did. Um, and, and also sort of in the, in the scope bucket was this question around enhanced content, whether we would go for the full sort of enriched message straight away um, and the use of structured data. So, so we really explored all of those topics with, with industry participants. We, we drew out their, their preferences, looked at the sort of pros and cons. Um, and, and the timing was quite good because um, we, we got that advice from PMPG suggesting that like for like was probably not the way to go. And, and that, that was a good steer for us because we were kind of heading in that direction. Um, Swift changed its timeline, pushed it back 12 months, as we all know, for cross-border. And so, again, that happened just before we kind of locked in our plans. So that, so that was good timing too. So off the back of those two events, we, we landed on a firm approach 
um, of a, an immediate move to the full message, in, including the optional use of structured data and enhanced content. Um, we opted for a two year coexistence period, um, sort of aligned to, to the three year coexistence period that the, the cross border will have. Um, and that was, you know, to give the participants flexibility in Australia, we have 45 participants in the high value system. So that's a lot of moving parts to, to take care of. Um, and on the timing, you know, we just thought it made sense to, to align to the CBPR plus timeline. Um, the, the drivers, as I sort of mentioned, really, it was about reducing risk, providing flexibility for participants, future proofing what we were implementing, um, bringing in things like structured data, the use of the LEIs in the message, which we don't really use in Australia yet. Um, some sort of efficiency drivers, if we had gone like for like, that would have meant a longer implementation, two sets of testing, two sets of going live. Um, harmonization with, with CBPR plus was one of the sort of factors that, that has, um, has aligned our approach. And, and overlaying all of that um, really is this driver to avoid truncation. So that's why we have um, the, the, the approach that we do where participants are, all participants are obligated to receive the new format message on day one. So there's no truncation there. Um, I, I recall our earliest conversations in this program, we were sort of still talking about that like for like approach and, and grappling with how we would resolve the challenge of data truncation and we never really solved for it. So, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we have this approach that avoids having to deal with data truncation um, is, you know, really fundamental to, to what we're doing. Um, and I guess just quickly, I'll mention, I suppose, whilst that, that all sounds great and that's, that's how we arrived at our approach, it, it does come with its challenges, this idea of coexistence, um, that, you know, participants have to continue to support MT and MX including including new members who may join in the next couple of years, they're still going to have to develop systems that can support MT and MX. Um, the, the fact that we have these two formats running side by side means that we will get some complexity. For example, um, returning an MT payment with a PAX4 or, or vice versa, and that's created a lot of complexity in the testing that we've developed for industry. Um, and, and the degree of flexibility that we're giving participants does mean that it's difficult to, to drive things like the adoption of structured data um, and, and even to instill urgency in our participant banks when they tend to see 2024 as the deadline, not 2022. Um, so, so those things, you know, would, would all go away if we had a big bang approach, but then that, that would have created a whole different set of headaches. And I think what we're doing is probably the right, the right approach for Australia. Yeah, good to hear. And I think a lot of similarities in terms of the Canadian approach and how we've defined it on our side for, for links, of course, the other piece that came into play for us was we went live with release one. So that was a significant lift for, for us. And so when we were thinking about having two major implementations uh, close together, to your point around flexibility uh, is what we were looking for and, and really being a uh, you know, community engagement and a, and a market-driven uh, approach to provide uh, flexibility for, for the FIs as we progress. Uh, in the Canadian context, um, we haven't defined the end of the coexistence as, as we will go live in November, uh, similar to yourselves requiring that all participants be capable of receiving um, the messages. Uh, but we're continuing to have discussions with the community uh, through this year uh, and looking to align on the timeline uh, for when we will end coexistence. And then of course, the, the work that will be you know, required uh, to support that in the years to come. Um, maybe we'll, we'll shift over and look from a participant's point of view. Lisa, of course, RBC is involved in, in different market infrastructures around the world, recognizing that some are going through coexistence, some are implementing uh, with a big bang approach. So how is RBC you know, managing this complexity in terms of the different approaches uh, that are being taken uh, through the different jurisdictions? You know, I think that's such a great question. And it's really interesting just even um, from listening to Rob and some of the best practices that you started to work your way through as a community uh, 
hang, you know, anchoring in on things like flexibility are really important. And then navigating through both at the domestic level and then to understand the implications of the other jurisdictions and potentially the uh, changes or the approaches that they would take and how would we be able to both participate and consume. And when you think about it from a participant perspective, that's actually not very different than what we've been going through internally. I think we're balancing as well too the needs of the clients across the different geographies. And what does that look like from an end-to-end -end payment experience? Uh, uh, Rob, I know you mentioned truncation. I think that's always top of mind for us. We know that we've got a number of clients that are first market movers, we'll call them that, that are already enabled from an ISO perspective. So to have this flexibility and to be able to reap those benefits and really be able to, to take advantage of that is top of mind. So no, understanding our clients, understanding the end-to-end -end payment flow, understanding and working domestically with our peers and our partners at the table. And I, I would say that Payments Canada has really given us that opportunity as a market infrastructure to have those open conversations, to really balance what the risks would look like because it's out of those decisions that we can then take it back internally. And when we look at it, we have a centralized team from an enterprise payments perspective that looks at this both uh, from a technology and operational and efficiency perspective that includes topics like compliance. And then of course, your lines of business that will participate in understanding what the end client experience is and what we're able to do is to lean in as a, as a single program to understand what do we need to uh, change, where do we need to invest, and how are we going to ourselves support this coexistence period. And I think we've, I think the good news is, is we lean into what we've seen in industry best practice globally. We've leaned into those conversations at the industry level. And then we can consume that and we've been able to mobilize around the activities that are needed in order to uh, make sure that we're supporting our clients. So hopefully some clients won't even know we've been ISO enabled or that we're in this coexistence period. So that's definitely top of mind because we do recognize that uh, our clients will be at different stages of um, enablement around that. And then it allows us to then support the broader customer base as we start to take advantage of those benefits. But we do have top of mind that single program for us has really been um, important. It allows us to participate at the industry level. It allows us to consume what the best practices are globally, but then work internally to understand what those risks are and then figure out what those mitigants uh, happen to be. So I, I really think that's important. And I think the only last thing I would say, we put training early around ISO. Now, from a customer perspective, I, and I will talk a little bit about that, you know, understanding ISO is a, a very different nuance, but internally, we've made sure that we've leveraged many of the tools that are available even through SWIFT that allows us to get in front of understanding ISO across a broader subset of resourcing and I think training both in your technology, in your product and your ops teams, and from a compliance really helps us to get in front of what we know we need to get to as an outcome. So, you know, we've really been, uh, we've, I think mobilizing around that single team has made a big difference. And, and that's a great uh, point, Lisa, in terms of the training and, and building the knowledge. As we know, as it's often referred to, ISO is, is a different language, and we're very comfortable with the legacy in terms of what we've been doing in the high value space for, for decades. Um, but building that knowledge, getting the training and the expertise on, as you say, the technology, the operational, the standard messaging standards as well, uh, I think has really been, been critical for all of us. Uh, in terms of ramping up and being in the level of, of preparedness uh, for implementation. Um, so Kelly Annie, so SWIFT of course is playing a critical role when we think about obviously how we are implementing within the domestic market infrastructures, be it Australia or, or Canada. But one of the, the key drivers of course is the global uh, adoption uh, as we progress. And as you highlighted, there are you know over 10,000 
uh, financial institutions and users on SWIFT. Um, so, you know, we're again about seven months out from implementation. Uh, can you give us a, a status in terms of how are things how are things progressing at the global uh, level as you think about uh, SWIFT uh, members and SWIFT users? Absolutely. And seven months sounds like a lot, but it will be over in a blink of a, of a minute. Trust me. So maybe maybe I'll just talk about uh, market infrastructures first, since it, I do have that purview now. And and we we do have twenty or so payment market infrastructures that are are on track and looking to go live. Of course, Auspay Net and Links as well. And and we've got five in APAC, Canada and AM UK. I have three in Europe, and I have eleven in Middle East, Africa, India, subcontinent is what we're calling it these days. I also have ten. Uh, mainly in East and Western Africa that potentially could go live this year, but we're, we're, we're really monitoring those very closely to see if that's what their intentions are, will be and, and, and make sure that we support them. And, and we essentially have a central uh, MI ISO migration uh, program team that's headed up by our, by our MI product tribe. Uh, that's supported by my go-to-market PMI team, all of our account management and business development and, and other stakeholders globally in order to make sure that we're monitoring and tracking them very closely. Now, if I think about the ISO Migration CBPR Plus program, as you can ma imagine this enormous program, uh, we are monitoring progress on the community on a variety of different facets. There are pages and pages of KPIs broken out quarter by quarter just to make sure that we are running to plan. And so the program currently is focused on supporting customers as they set up their test environments and preparing for live deployment of the inflow translation service. So we're seeing high level of engagements across our, our customers. They start their testing journey. So what is that? Let's talk specifics. I love to bring my little report cards to these events and share with the community that I'm with how you're doing, uh, uh, tracking to the global um, community. And, and we're really really focusing on two key items. So we're, we're looking at how well is our communities, uh, are they upgrading their interfaces to be able to accept those embedded MX messages and also testing. So that essentially at the end of the day, those are the two things that we're, we're really laser focused on right now. So if I look at my scores right now from a global community standpoint, I can see 63% from, uh, you know, who's upgrading their interfaces that have upgraded in a live or test environment. Now, if we just look at a live environment, that number is about 40% of the global community. Now, Canada. So Canada is 59% of upgrading their interfaces in a live or test environment. And it's 33% in the live environment. So slightly lower than the global average. But what's happening in testing? So these numbers are, are as about as good as early uh, April. And what I'm seeing from a global community standpoint is 15% of the community is testing the receipt of CBPR plus traffic. And we have 7% of the community testing the sending of CBPR traffic. Canada, Canada's slightly higher. So we're actually seeing 25% of the Canadian market testing the receipt as well as the sending of CBPR traffic. So you're actually running slightly higher than, than the uh, global community. So well done, must say well done to Canada on that. So other things that, I, that we track that I'm happy to share with you, when we look at inflow translation testing, we can see that 93% of all the testing is really focused on the happy flows, which means no translation errors. And we're only seeing about 3% of the, of the community really looking at all of the different truncation uh, use cases. So we really could do a little bit better uh, on our testing there. And then we also see the majority of messages that are being tested, 87% tend to be PAX 008s. So I'm uh, happy to give you a little bit of that, of what's happening. But really, the, the community is making some good progress. November is going to be here before we know it. So it's it's just keep on testing. Great. Thanks. Well, glad to see. Yes, as you say, at least when we look at some of the testing, we're, we're uh, doing quite well. Uh, and then, uh, but I know things are ramping up uh, as they are on the links uh, side as well. So over the next uh, coming weeks and months, uh, I would expect those numbers to continue to, or continue to see some, some good increases on those numbers leading up. So let's um, shift gears uh, slightly and think about, you know, 
any of these big projects, these big implementations are, are all about how we manage uh, risk, um, both, uh, you know, um, internally within the programs and of course with our partners and with our, our customers, it really is critical to, to our success. So just looking to see in terms of, you know, what are your organizations doing to mitigate the risk as we look forward to the, the implementation? And so maybe Kellyanne, if I can ask you just to build off of perhaps what you've, you've been saying, but just as an organization, SWIFT and working with your members, what are some of the key things you're looking at from, from a risk mitigation perspective? Sure. And, and I think our entire approach to the CBPR plus migration is really all about taking a bunch of steps to mitigate risk. And, and, and one of our really guiding principles is to, that nobody's left behind and, and that institutions are able to work on the adoption in their own way, whatever suits them as and their customers. And that, and that essentially is our guiding principle. But if I think about some of the specific steps that we've taken, so we, we've specified this three year coexistence period to avoid a big bang in November so that, you know, to really assist our customers. And, and we've provided interoperability measures like inflow translation so that customers that wanna be ready with ISO right away and the ones that you know, may need to take some time, they can still, transact, do business together with minimal disruption. We've also provided uh, test messaging services to all of our, our SWIFT users. And that environment was really, it was provided November of last year. So they have a full year to really familiarize themselves with the environment, with the messages uh, before, before the actual migration coming in November. And as part of that, there's a test sparring partner service that allows a bank to, in a very controlled manner, exchange messages with, and, and the service will mimic uh, a partner bank. So you don't actually need a live bank to, to test with you. We also have a opt-in only ISO 222 capability that we're offering in August, really for our, our early adopters who don't wanna wait till November. So they can start doing some penny testing. They can familiarize themselves with the environment. So that will be available to them in August. We've also uh, addressed the risk of some of the message truncation. I think we've heard that a few times already on this call, you know, working closely with the CBPR plus working group and providing guidance to the community on, on how to deal with those truncations. And of course, this massive comprehensive awareness and readiness program that we've been running for two years, really closely monitoring the testing activity, other readiness activities, and being able to step in and intervene in markets or help support customers where we're, we're noticing problems. So if I talk about a, a PMI slightly just a, as well. So PMIs, of course, you know, they can they can do the big bang, they can do a coexistence. I know both, both uh, Lynx and Ospay have done the coexistence, but Swift is happy to support both of them. It's really up to the MI and what they choose. And we, uh, uh, of course, we support our MIs and their communities with documentation, testing services and resources. And, and I talked about, we have 20 that are ready to go this year, but we have another hundred that, that have yet to really define what their plans are. So we'll be, we've actually offering them a standardized pack called the ISO Accelerator Pack, which is a standardized offering that we're looking to then help support them with their migrations, which will help hopefully help with uh, limiting the timelines for projects. So we're trying to get them down to, an, instead of a multi-year project down to an uh, an eight month project. And that's really based off of HVPS plus the user guidebooks, the market practices. And of course we have all of our, our tools available on my standards, testing on readiness portal, uh, Swiss smart training, sample messages and Val. So the whole full package that we're looking to offer PMIs moving forward. Thanks for that. Um, Lisa, I guess from, a, from an FI, from a participant perspective, as you look to November, how are, how are you preparing and working through some of these key risk uh, strategies and mitigants? Yeah, listen, I, I think it's such a great question. Uh, a couple of things I'll lean into. One, I do think the participation that we do have and representation across our program at the varying levels, whether that actually be in Payments Canada in a number of the forms that we have available to us, whether it's participation in things like the PMPG from a SWIFT perspective, uh, whether it's in some of the national member group conversations and the ability to introduce new forums. I think that's always important for us because there's a couple of things we get to do there. Um, 
aside from what you would think is really good governance, really good discipline and pro program management to be able to take a project of this size across uh, almost your entire organization, I think understanding how the communities are, are operating, what their readiness is, is always so important. And I'll lean into a lot of the work that we did. I think we had that advantage here in, in Canada with the deployment of links. So when we identified many of the risks in this conversation about Big Bang, because we'd only just gone through that conversation, and we'd actually put a lot of really good routines, including um, stress testing ourselves on when we would be ready across our domestic um, environment from an industry perspective. When would we test so that we could create the buddy systems on how to de-risk either Big Bang, what the fallover would look like, and if you had to fall back, what would that look like? So I think all of those same risks that we'd identified through that process, we are still mirroring what that would look like from an ISO because there are so many uh, great practices that we have there. And I think understanding the participant um, activation and where our partners are in that is, is so important. From an internal perspective, to be ready to mobilize for ISO has been fairly significant in so much as that many of us had to make investments into our infrastructure. And so with that, we wanna make sure that we have planned that well in advance so that we can actually stress test the deployment with no disrupt disruption into our existing flows. And so being able to get in front of that before we hit those November dates and or before we have to support a coexistence period. So being able to identify what all of those program deployments would look like internally, which would include things like rigor and discipline around testing, uh, engagement across all key stakeholders, um, and being able to make sure that we've understood all the endpoints so that we can do um, a volume test with our customer base as well so that we understand their readiness if there was someone that wanted to deploy. So from a risk management perspective, I think those are really the key things, but I do really want to stress, I think those engagements across the community and the different forums has really been very beneficial because for us as a participant, it allows us to understand lessons learned, what worked well, and then we can also mobilize around those things. And then I would say, Kaliani, I think the ability to come out and test early uh, in the different tools that you've provided to be able to take advantage of that is so important for the participants because then you can start to un anticipate the unhappy path because we have to think about what will happen in inquiries and escalations and failed payments and uh, truncation. So if all of those conditions are existing, how would we be able to get in front of that? So we've been documenting that for a long period of time and then being able to put key actions and mitigants in front of it. Excellent. I think, yeah, that's, you know, some consistency or it resonates in terms of it's about, you know, planning properly. It's about testing. It's about communication, really, in terms of within the team, across, you know, the organization, within the industry, and more broadly with the partners and what have you, as well, all involved in terms of stakeholders is, is really critical to the success. Um, Rob, maybe just in terms of um, the Australian model and, and how you've been progressing, I guess maybe are we able to, uh, if you're able to add some um, context around how you're managing that risk and then maybe looking out a little bit beyond implementation, where do you see things going uh, over the next coming years as you think about coexistence and that in the Australian market? Yeah, it, it's um, it's interesting listening to the other panelists talk about this because I guess the, the themes are very common. You know, it's it is <clears throat> for us very much about um, communication in our program. So we're a very comms heavy sort of um, industry program. Um, we we do a lot of reporting outward to our participants, and, and they report in into us. We run information sessions every couple of weeks on. We do deep dives on topics, so we do a lot of. Um, education and information sharing. We, we promote the resources that are provided by SWIFT. Um, so it, it is for us very much about making sure that everyone knows everything they need to know, that they have access to all of the available information. Um, and, um, you know, we, we typically will get 150 participants and stakeholders come to these information sessions that we run. So um, they're, they're very well attended. 
we we have extensively documented a lot of market practice to, to drive consistent behavior and, and use of the new messages. Um, so, so there is the comms aspect of it that, that we do focus on strongly. And then of course, testing that, that the other panelists have talked about already, and we've just begun our, our industry test phase. We, we have six months set aside for industry testing through unilateral, bilateral, multilateral. We, we're prescribing in, in quite a lot of detail a test plan and all of the test cases that, that participants have to do, including a happy path and, and negative um, situations. So, so we will draw out some of that stuff in, in testing. Um, we're going to have formal attestations and certification that will be required. So nobody's going to be able to join our production cug until we're satisfied that they've proven that all their systems work. Um, and, and that there was mention of, of penny testing, you know, we're going to have, a, a, we, we're developing now a detailed plan for transition to live and how we do production verification testing in the lead up to, um, you know, our sort of official live date. Um, so, so, you know, we, we're using, um, all of the consistent, um, ideas with, with what Swift talk about for their global program and, and what you've talked about for Canada, um, and, and, you know, the, the, also, I guess, um, it, it, we, we do work very closely with all of our participants. So, so we catch up with them individually frequently and, and we get a really accurate picture of where they're up to and what they're worried about and how we can help them. So, um, so, you know, that, that's sort of another way that we address risks, um, at an individual participant level. Um, and, and you asked sort of about what the, what the future looks like for, for our program. Um, when we began, we sort of planned up until the end of this year, but of course, um, somebody recently said the project really begins in November. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we think there's a future for our program for another three years, um, because of the flexibility in this coexistence approach, you know, we've only probably got half of our participants implementing the full suite of functionality this year. So there's a lot that are setting up just with a sort of tactical solution to receive only, which means that, that we're going to have to cycle through another round of industry testing and coordinated um, implementation next year for some of our participants. And then again in 2024 for the rest. So, so that's certainly what the next couple of years look like as well as thinking about how to drive the adoption of structured data. We think that's key to, to releasing the benefit of the new message. Um, so we'll need to develop some market practice around that and then figure out how to encourage its adoption. Um, we're also going to want to run through, um, a, a cycle of a major version change of the message, which we think we'll do in 2025. Once it, once everyone's on board with the, with the new messaging. Um, so, so that'll be a fairly big piece of work for the first time we do it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to make sure that we set ourselves up then to be able to do that regularly in the future. Um, and of course, you know, we'll also have to think about decommissioning the old MT cug at some point in 24, 25. Um, so our, our focus is still going to be about the, the participants rather than how they sort of relate to their customers, but, um, and making sure that we just get this whole sort of migration piece finished and everything onto MX and nothing left on MT. But um, yeah, we'll be busy for the next three years or four years. Yeah, yeah most definitely, as, as I think we all will be too. It, and it's a good analogy. This really is the, the beginning. It's not the end. Uh, so there's quite a bit to, to still be done. So we've just got a couple minutes left here in, in the session. So I just wanted to provide an opportunity uh, Lisa, perhaps just in terms of um, some thoughts or closing comments uh, in terms of, you know, ISO and where we're headed in the high value space. Uh, and so if you, you can, uh, if you have some remarks on that. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, it's just such a, it's so great to be here because you can hear the different perspectives on how we're all moving with this momentum towards an outcome that we've been mobilizing around for a very long time. And Rob, love what you said, you know, it's just the beginning. And Kellyanne, to see how many participants that we're all leaning into this, this new way. But I have to come back to the excitement that I have. Why ISO? Why has an entire global community starting to rally around standardization? And I probably admitted up front, I don't like to tell how many years I've been in payments, but you can 
you know what the friction points are and it really comes down to the integrity of the data and the ability to be able to put the information that is needed around this exchange of, of value that's coming through. So I like to imagine the future. And for me, I think this is a game changer. This is the paradigm shift that we've been mobilizing and working towards in the business community. I start thinking about how we can start to address things, you know, like returns and rejections. I mean, they should no longer be the case in the future. And when we think about this, our businesses, including our own, can do this at a lower marginal cost because we will have been able to address so many of the challenges that customers continue to face with the exchange of these large value transactions coming through. Now imagine a world of transparency. Imagine a world where at the fingertips in real time, a business customer can understand where the status of their M&A transaction and settlement is sitting understand that on both sides of that transaction, that both of those customers on the two endpoints will have the ability to go in and understand what is happening with that deal that's going through. But understand the regular consumer, you know, someone who's trying to get their funds um, during a crisis to really important family members that are sitting in a different um, country and how they'll be able to actually track through it. And I believe that the data gives us the ability to mobilize around the tools to think about these new solutions differently. And then for us in Canada, I think we have this advantage. I, I love that we're hitting the ground running on all of our payment capabilities. We're really leaning in. Any new model coming in will be ISO enabled. That standardization for us to create simplified experiences for our end customers and to really enable our market around the transparency in real time of these payment flows is, is just so exciting. Um, I, I, For me, that is the game changer. That's where I think the excitement starts to really build up. And I love the fact that there will be many customers out there will never know what an ISO transaction standard looks like because we'll be able to give them solutions because the data will be able to lead the way in that type of uh, experience. So I'm really excited about it. Excellent. Yes, and I think we all are as well, because it really is the power of, of the data and the power of the solutions and what we can do to bring to market. Final word to you, Kalyani, just in terms of any parting words as we wrap this session. For me, it's test, test, test. But uh, it's, it's funny, you know, we all represent different areas, different organizations, but we've all come together and said very similar things about ISO 22, which is wonderful. Some of the notes that I had, you know, it, November is not just the, the uh, it's just the beginning, right? It's not the end, which is very similar to what's already been said. And, and we only are successful when the entire community adopts. So it's nice to hear that we're all traveling down that same path. Great. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all for joining us uh, and sharing your expertise today. Uh, it's really been a, a great pleasure uh, to help moderate this session with you and some great knowledge uh, that we've imparted uh, out to our attendees. So thanks to everyone uh, online for your time and your interest in today's session. Uh, have a great day.